Thank you for joining us for another podcast from Bryce Canyon Bible Church. I delight in you, Lord Jesus Christ. We are located next to Bryce Canyon National Park in Tropic, Utah. Now for the message. Okay, we're picking up the first message in our series, Having Lion-Hearted Faith. And last week was an introduction to that, and we talked about how in this world there are many fake heroes. We talked about American Idol, The Voice, and all this stuff where we just raise somebody up and they become really a pop star. No real substance. Maybe a talent here and there, but... You know, what are real heroes? And we talked about real heroes are those that are lion-hearted in their faith. And when you look at that picture, you think, well, I'm not a lion. But we talked about how Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah, he dwells in you. Therefore, by faith, you are lion-hearted. And each person we're going to be looking at over the next few weeks, each one of them is an example of an unlikely hero in unlikely times. And today is no difference there. We have Enoch, and Enoch is uh, faith to walk into heaven. He had the faith to walk right into heaven. And as we're looking at Enoch, it's a compelling and yet very short biography in the Bible about a man that did something amazing by faith. And I wanted to point out to you something that as we look at examples in the Bible, as we look at them, the goal is for us to from that say, how can I be like that? And Lord, what do you want to teach me? Because all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is to teach us. So I was reading about George W. Bush's secret book he's been writing for a couple of years. I don't know if you knew about it, but he's writing a, a, a biography about his dad, George H. W. Bush, the 41st president being written by the 43rd. And people are all just both Republicans, Democrats, Politico, all these people are, wow! We didn't know about this. This is out of the box. He kept it a secret. And he's just been in the little catacombs of his house there, painting and writing. You know, he is a a decent painter. So, anyways, uh, people are interested to hear what he has to say about his dad. And I was reading about this book, and Mark McKinnon, one of George W. Bush's former political advisors, said this of um, Bush and his dad. He says, I've never seen a son that loves his father more. Absolute and unconditional. He says, during one of our visits to Kennebunkport, Maine, with both Bushes, McKinnon said, quote, The interaction was so pure, sweet, and compelling that afterwards I snuck off to call my father to tell him how much I miss him. I thought, that's the essence of what we're doing this morning. We're looking at individuals that will provoke you to pick up the telephone and call your father. Pick up your telephone and call your father. And by that, I just mean saying, Father God, here's Enoch. I see his life and what he's like. I want to be like him. We used to play this little game, and we still do at times. It's called Bible Heroes, and it's this little game where you try, it's kind of like old maid. You try not to be stuck with Methuselah. He's the oldest guy, 969 years old in the Bible. And if you're stuck with Methuselah at the end, you lose. And I just remember that game, when you open the package, it says, Bible Heroes is the name of it. And it says, their little subtitle says, I want to be like them. I thought, yeah, that's it. I want to be like them. So that's the attitude we're approaching these heroes this morning. We want to be like them. So as we get into looking at Enoch, we're going to read Genesis 5, 21 through 24 first, because there are three passages that deal with Enoch. And let's start with the Old Testament, the first passage. Genesis chapter 5. 21 through 24. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. That's a compelling passage, and I'm so thankful we have the book of Hebrews and Jude that talk about this. Otherwise, I believe there would be some liberal commentators out there that say, ah, oh, what's the word took mean? It means, oh, took him closer or took him away somewhere. And we wouldn't think of it as dramatic. He was raptured, folks. This is an Old Testament rapture. It's the word that would be used for rapture, just snatched away. 
This could happen any time that the rapture is going to take place, the snatching away of believers. And maybe one day down the road we'll talk about eschatology, future events and the rapture. We've done that in a lot of our church plants. But this is an Old Testament snatching away. He's the only one in the Old Testament except for one other that was snatched away without dying. Can anybody think of the other Old Testament personality who was raptured away? Elijah. Elijah. Yeah. Elijah the prophet. And how was he snatched away? Chariot of fire. This whirlwind, dramatic moment. <laughs> taken away dramatically. Wow. You know, and you think about that. And here's Enoch. And it gives us not only the fact that he's raptured away, but the reason. And we're going to look at that. And this is compelling. There's a few short verses, right, that we're looking at here. But I think it's so interesting that the New Testament delineates even further so we don't misinterpret that this is indeed a, a taking away, a zapping out, if you will, of Enoch up to heaven. And that's why we call it faith to walk into heaven. Because his faith with God just brought him right out immediately. Let's look now at Hebrews chapter 11. Keep your place in these three passages. We'll be flipping all around here between the three. And in fact, you know what? I just remembered I have them on the overhead too. So you can either read it up here or flip to it in your Bible. There are pew Bibles in front of you if you want to use those. Okay, Hebrews 11, 5 and 6. By faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. That's really cool, isn't it? This is explaining that yes, he was raptured away because he pleased God. Then let's look at Jude 14 and 15. Jude only has one chapter. So it's verses 14 and 15 of the book of Jude. If you'll turn there, Jude is right before the book of Revelation. Jude is like 2 Peter. It's a book that tells us false prophets are coming into the church, false teachers who will take God's word and twist it in different ways. And there's a warning by Jude and, and Peter. They're, they're like, be careful. They're coming within the church. That's why we've we got to be very careful what we teach in the church even because these warnings are given. You know, that we, we, must only, we can't go beyond what is written here. So it says, it was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against Him. That, folks, is the original hell, fire, and brimstone message. Do you realize this is the first prophecy ever given in the Bible? Ever. It predates any others. And we have a unique glimpse here to look into this. Jude, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, was able to put this right out there before us. Enoch was a prophet. Not just a goody-goody two-shoes walking through the world without putting his feet in the spiritual mud. No, he was one that stood there at the corner, just like his great-grandson did. Who was his great-grandson? Any ideas who Enoch's great-grandson is? Noah! Noah! Noah was Enoch's great-grandson, if you trace the genealogies. And and we're going to tie some connections here, but Noah was also, what, a preacher of righteousness, it says in 2 Peter. So Enoch passed that legacy down. Enoch stood there at the crossroads, and he said, Hey, folks, judgment is coming And it's related to your what? There's one word he keeps using there all the time. What is that repeated word? It's related to your... It's used about four times. Ungodliness. That which is against God. And he even says at the end, you speak against Him. So, Enoch was a prophet. And I was so encouraged this week. One of you came up to me and said, Hey, there's someone I work with. And I feel and sense the urgency of their soul. That they, they don't know Christ, and if they die, Scripture clearly teaches they're going to go to eternal destruction forever. And I've invited this person to, to come to church, and I say, hey, that's a great first step. Because, you know, starting even with that, and I think the next thing following through by, if they don't come to church, be an Enoch. You know, step up on your soapbox in love and say, hey, you know, <laughs> this is what's at stake for you and every other person and for me. 
So Enoch was not afraid to do that. This is one reason God said, you're my friend. Come on up here. Woof. Pulls him up because he had a voice in darkness. So you see already we're looking at a serious hero here, people. The consequences of a faith walk. What are the consequences of a person who lives like Enoch? I want you to first look at the benefits, okay? Because we already read in Hebrews 11, it says God is a rewarder of those that by faith diligently seek Him. He rewards them. So what are the consequences if you walk by faith like Enoch did? Well, let's look here. Many will remember you. Do you want to be remembered after you're gone? I think that's legitimate because here we have Enoch. Enoch had a testimony, it says, and according to the writers of Hebrews, and um, th- his testimony lasted, get a load of this, 4,000 years. Because Hebrews are writing 4,000 years later, they're writing about Enoch. They're writing about him. What about four th- if, if the Lord should tarry for 4,000 more years? If he should, I doubt he will, but if he does, will there be some inkling of your legacy that you've left for Christ? Well, you know, looking at Enoch, we're, we're, we're inspired by that. It's all about his glory, right? We're not saying puffing ourselves up and getting our names in books, no. But we're just talking about this is a consequence. We see it here. And not only that, I'm talking about Enoch 2,000 years later. That's 6,000 years after he's gone. We're talking about a hero. That's a legacy. Who won American Idol three years ago, four years ago? <laughs> Who knows? American idolatry is what I like to call it. So, you know, those things don't matter. Okay, number two, many will miss you. You want to be missed when you're gone. I, you know, I remember in Chad, Africa, we were a missionary and, you know, evangelist working with the nomads of Chad for quite a few years, 10 years in Africa. While we were there, there was a guy named Raka, and he was a Muslim, and he came and did the welding on our windows. We had to put antivol, it was called this anti-thief bars that we had to put on our people to break in. There's a lot of theft there. So he came and before he welded the bars with his welding machine, he got down on his mat and did his Muslim prayers. And we, the way he did it, we could tell was in defiance against what we stood for him while we were there. And we let him finish and everything and, you know, loved him, shared the Lord as much as we could with him. Just remember um, someone coming to me as we were repairing our roof. We had 10 roofs. I was up there working on it and this guy came and said, hey, Raka, he's dead. I said, really? Yes, he's dead. He, he died. He, he inhaled so much of the fumes and stuff from welding that, that it got to him. And he, he, he had a pulmonary issue and he died. And I was like, wow, he was a rich man in town. One of the, you know, he had this big boutique with, you know, it was like a store with gas and barrels. You know, he was pretty rich by African standards. But I, I just thought, you know, what, what was his legacy? Where, you know, I just kept thinking about him. Like I was just up there singing on my roof one of the songs by... Keith Green that kept coming to my mind. Who you gonna throw in the lake of fire? Oh, God, my Lord. Who you gonna throw when the flames getting higher? Oh, God, my Lord. The devil and the man with the dark desire. Oh, God, my Lord. I just kept singing that, that little phrase thinking, you know, judgment is coming for everyone who doesn't know Christ, and, and now Raka today, you know, what legacy has he left? What is remembered from him? And there's something about that that just spoke to me, realizing he was entrenched in a false religion and very tenacious about his rebellion against God and truth. But you'll be missed, and, and you say, well, how so with, how is Enoch missed? Well, it says in Hebrews that he was not found. He was not found that others were obviously looking for him, and he had an extensive family. Imagine he had sons and daughters. Now, he lived 365 years, and and if there's an atheist listening to this podcast now, ha, yeah, listen to you Christians. You talk about people, Methuselah living 969 years, a bunch of fairy tales and myths. Well, here's what you have to remember. This was pre-flood, right? It was a time when the Bible talked about this layer of water being around the earth, the, the actually the, the atmosphere was very different. The ground was watered how? From the ground up, a mist came up and watered everything. Very different ecosystem. Very different. So the ultraviolet rays, you know, they look at that and say it would have had very little effect, which causes aging. And see, after the flood took place, people began very much short lives down to you get to Abraham and David and others, 120 some years of age, and then now to us today, what, 80 years to hopefully 90. So 
very explainable when you understand pre-flood. You know, there are even those that say, how do you get all this petrol and, and all the, um, when you dig, you know, where does, all, where does all the vegetation that caused all that come from? And, and we say, well, during, before the flood, it was a very lush tropical atmosphere based on what we know. So those are a few quick answers to maybe any atheist question about the age thing. But Enoch, by, if you take, if you break down the average age of Enoch, listen to this. Enoch's lifespan, he was roughly 38% of the lifespan of the average person at 365 years of age. Imagine that. So that would put him at about a 27-year-old man equivalent of today, if you base it on how long they used to live. So he lived a short life in that way. However, imagine the, the tribe he would have had, kids and grandkids and great-grandkids and all of that. So this is an argument, too, for us to realize Whenever we put up the excuse, God, my life's too complicated. Huh, really? Nothing like Enoch. Nothing as complicated as Enoch. And we're, I'm getting ahead of myself. Some of your family will follow you. And <clears throat> by this, it doesn't mean absolutely every one of your kids will be faithful and follow you. But we do know that Enoch had Noah, his great-grandson. You follow the genealogies. He came through the line. Uh, obviously, Noah would have had to have been affected by Enoch and his preaching. Because he became a preacher of righteousness in a dark world. And many of Enoch's other sons and daughters and family members, they were wiped away in the flood. They didn't believe. Noah did. And by this, I just want to say to you, maybe not all of your family or kids will follow the Lord. But Enoch leaves us a realization that some will. Give us a heritage of faithful children. God wanted him as another consequence of a faith walk. Do you want to be wanted by God? Is that something that appeals to you? Because it says, um, God took him. And in the Hebrew, that word for took, it means to take something for yourself as a benefit or a treasure. He took him as a benefit and a treasure. He wanted him to be with him. It says in Psalm 4, 3, But know that the Lord has set apart the godly man for himself. You're set apart for the Lord. Set apart for Him. He wants to set you apart for Himself. Psalm 4, 3. Psalm 116, 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His godly ones. So when a person dies, God looks at that as a precious moment. Why? Because 2 Corinthians 5, 8 says to be absent from the body is what? Present with the Lord. That's a precious moment. God wanted Enoch. Those are four points of a faith walk. Many will remember you. Many will miss you. Some of your family will follow you. God wants you. I think it's a better way to put it. Okay, now, characteristics of a faith walk. What's a faith walk look like? Hebrews 11.5 is our text for this. If you want to open to that passage, we're going to be looking and delineating, drawing out principles from Hebrews chapter 11. And so here we have those who walk with God are pleasing to Him. And this word is a very interesting word in the Greek. It's actually three pieces of words all put together. It has a prefix and two words merged together. The first part of the word means to rise up and elevate. The next part, to stir up pleasing emotions. And the third part of this word is a very. In other words, it intensifies. So you put it all together and you come up with this compound meaning of that Greek word. To cause, to rise up and stir up very pleasing emotions. Can you imagine your life does that to God as He, His eyes are upon you, He's looking at you, and, and He has these stirred up, elevated, very pleased emotions. That's what took place with Enoch. He caused God's heart to wail up, wheel up and stir up with satisfaction. Oh, that this may be true of us also, that let's be sons and daughters of Enoch. Okay, he prayed for our nation and our generation. How about if we start right here and we stop complaining about Obama this Obama that and this senator this senator we pray for them yes we can critique things yes and say oh that's not righteous that's not okay but here's the point let's let the change start here and say rob this rob that let, let my heart change let it begin with me change my heart you know that should be our heartbeat that should be our heartbeat to be pleasing to God Okay, the second point here. Those who walk with God are prophets of God. We've already looked at this, and you can turn to Jude 14 and 15 again to look at that passage. Here we have Jude vocalizing the truth of God. And 
The theme of his sermon in those verses could be put in vernacular English like this. Hey you, the ungodly ones, you better stop it for God's judgment is coming. (laughs) That's just, you know, can you imagine that? That's kind of how it, that's what's being said here. Hey you, you godly ones, stop it. (laughs) Judgment is coming. That is a message that would get you a black eye, bloody nose, kicked out of most places and who knows what endured for that. But we know God was pleased. And we know that we're to speak the truth, what? In love. Ephesians 4.15, speak the truth in love. That we are to, whatever we speak, no matter what the words are, to be a loving motive. And does that mean we're little milk toes, panty waist? No, it, it means that we are to, to speak the truth that we say with the, the trying to be restorative. That the truth may restore people and respecting their who they are, whether they're an authority or not. When Paul stood before Agrippa, when he stood before the high priest and and so forth, he was respectful to them. Oh, Agrippa, I am thankful to come to you because I know you understand their traditions of the Jewish people, our people. And now hear me, oh, Agrippa, for I am not a crazy man in my message. This I bring to you that Jesus is the Messiah. So he spoke the truth. He engulfed it in a very respectful introduction. And I would challenge you to do the same. And I'm sure Enoch in his culture, in his way, was loving, respectful, but forthright. And we see that forthrightfulness. And I would like to ask you, this week, have you been the voice of a prophet to somebody? What do I mean by voice of a prophet? I mean bringing forth prophetic truth that's already revealed right here. We don't have to invent anything, come up with something new. It's here. Just bring forth what is said. You bring that. Have you brought forth and delivered a prophetic message, a message from God's Word to somebody this week in some way, the workplace, a friend. Maybe you're working side by side with somebody and they let out a bunch of bad words and and you're there next to them. Maybe you just give a kind of look where they're like, oh, hey, sorry I said that. And and, you know, from that just saying, you know, hey, I used to do that too, so I understand. So, but yet it does offend me because right now, you know, the Bible says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. I know Jesus Christ and I'm not perfect, but he's certainly changing me. And hey, do you know him? You know, little things like that you can evangelize. Rise, O oh church. Evangelize. Evangelize. It doesn't get any better than that, folks, because his word is exalted above his name. God's word is exalted above his name. Can't go beyond it, can't go under it. We go right to it. Three, those who walk with God have a practical walk with God. A practical walk with God. There's a, it says, um, a walk talks and a talk talks. But a walk talks louder than a talk talks. Did you get that? <laughs> a walk talks and a talk talks. But a walk talks louder than a talk talks. I grew up hearing that from my pastor. And the simple thing is, hey, your walk, your, your everyday practical life, it has an impact more than what you say. We just talked about the prophetic voice, didn't we? It's empty if you're not living it. You're like, oh, Pastor Rob, man, you're, now you're slamming. You tell me to talk, now you tell me to walk. Okay, here's the point. If we talk, it should match our walk, right? And if it doesn't, Jesus even said this, hey, get first pull the log out of your own eye. Then you'll know and see clearly how to pull it out of someone else's. Ray Rice just got a, uh, convicted of domestic violence. He's an amazing NFL athlete for those of you who like sports. He was on my fantasy team at one point, and he's a really great guy, makes lots of points for people. But the thing is, he got in an altercation with his wife, so domestic violence, and he came before the media, and he says, this is unacceptable, it's wrong. And he says, I want to help others. But he said this, which is biblical. I don't know where he's at with the Lord, but he said a biblical principle. He says, I want one day to be able to help others with domestic violence. He says, but I'm not ready yet. First, I've got to get my own act together. He says, once I do that, once I get my own act together, I want to go help others. I thought, fair enough. Fair enough. And maybe you're dealing with pornography men. Maybe one of you is engulfed in that. And statistically, it wouldn't surprise me if somebody in here struggles with it. If you've got that, don't think you can go out and talk to people about purity and holiness yet. You've got to deal with that one. Get that log out of your eye and get some, uh, a track record of purity, and then you can go and help others. So that's the point of Enoch here. He's not saying, hey, stop pornography while he's secretly looking at it behind the scenes, okay? That's just one example that I happen to pull out sporadically here. Now, the fourth one, those who walk with God have a persevering walk with God. 
This is very important, very important. And this one touched my heart as I heard it because Jesus said those that endure to the end will be saved. And and the parable of the, the sower and the seed, Jesus says if you understand this parable, you understand them all. It's them, all of them hang on this. That the sower went out to sow the seed. And what does he say the seed is? It tells us in the passage, cross-references. The seed is what? The Word of God. That's the Word of God we're sowing this morning. It went out and it fell in the soils. And he said, no, the soils are the hearts of men. One fell in the hard soil. And he says, that's the hard heart where the birds come. And they, when the seed falls in the hard soil, the birds take the seed away. And that's the seed of God's Word falling on a hard heart. Satan comes and lifts it out immediately. You've seen that. You've shared Christ with people. Their heart's hard. Immediately they forget it and turn away. Satan takes it away. And then there's what? There's the thorny ground. The seed falls in and it does produce and start to spring up. And you look, oh, wow, salvation, great. But it's not real. It's just a facade. It springs up. And then when the cares of this world and a desire for other things comes, that thorny ground, just like thorns that come up, they choke and kill the true seed that had produced. And it dies, doesn't it? And you say, well, it's not real. It didn't endure. And then there's the, the one that falls on rocky soil. The seed falls in. It, it once again springs up. But it only lasts for a certain amount of time because it has no root. There are rocks underneath the ground we didn't see. Like if I would plant out here and there's a level of gravel underneath, it would grow for so long and die. And that is, Jesus says, is the one that believes and begins to spring up and then persecution comes. Persecution comes. The family members around you, against you, those things hit you and all of a sudden you shrivel difficult time comes your boss steps up and says you follow that Jesus it's over with me and you and I know someone literally that happened to what do you do oh okay well I I guess I gotta do your thing so I can make money you know our, our okay our trials our persecutions test our hearts and reveal and the true believer will ultimately stand firm and that's the the seed that falls on good soil thank God for the the good soil and If you look at it statistically, and I don't hold this in a wooden fashion, but about a fourth of those that profess Christ fall away. And it it could fluctuate one way or the other. I don't think you can, like I said, have a wooden percentage on that. But let's just say for just for explaining, 25% of those that you lead to Christ, maybe a fourth of them are true. The good soil where the seed falls in and they believe in this is what they bear fruit. It keeps growing over the long haul. 30 and 60 and 100 fold. Look at the grass out there that we planted. Smokey and I, we, we threw seed and we need to pray for Smokey. Remind me at the end. She's got back trouble. I forgot to pray for her. Um, the seed produced. And you say, well, how so? Well, good soil. We took peat moss and threw it down and worked the soil. I tilled, tilled it. We flattened it, covered it with everything and then weed and feed. And, and now it's growing. God has his weed and feed. And the weeds fall away. True believers will grow. And so this is the point that we're making, persevering faith. Enoch persevered, because he's our example here today. The ways that he persevered were that he walked with God for 300 years. Anybody walked with God 300 years yet? (laughs) No hands going up. So um, that's quite a legacy. That's longer than our nation has been a nation. The United States of America has not been officially a nation for that long. That's how long he walked with God. And you say, well, he didn't live in our world, so he had it easy. (laughs) Wait a minute. Not so fast on that excuse. Time out. Do you realize it was during that generation, very very soon after that, a few hundred years, that um, God destroyed the entire world with a flood because Genesis says all the world was doing nothing but evil continually except for one man and his family, Noah. Tell me that Enoch didn't live in a dark time. Much darker than ours. Much darker than ours. It's dark out, I agree. But not to the point of the flood coming like it did just soon after with Noah's with Enoch's grandson. He persevered through all of that. So we have no excuse. Those who walk with God have a personal walk with God. Enoch didn't just talk for God, work for God, or serve God, but rather he walked with God. Remember the word walk is used often in the New Testament. And what is the meaning of it? It means a practice, a continual. Thing. And, and to walk here used as a relationship. 
Christianity is all about relationships. You take relationship out of it all, and it just becomes religion, sacramentalism, you know, just going through the motions. Notice it didn't say Enoch was baptized, did the Lord's Supper, he did a bunch of offerings, and God took him. No. It says Enoch walked with God. Are you excited about your personal relationship with God? I mean, do you get really excited about that? You know, I, I remember early dating days, you know, with Joanne, just excited about being with her and still do love her. But imagine with God, you know, hey, I get to go in my prayer closet today for an hour and just do nothing but talk my heart out to him and listen to him and read his, listen to his voice as he speaks to me. Do you ever get lost reading his word where you're just flipping and going from page to page, love letters? That's a good evidence you're walking with God. There's a love there, a relationship. And if you don't, pull away and cultivate that. You know, cultivate that relationship with God. Because Enoch had that. We're not talking religion, folks. We're talking a relationship. All right, number six. Those who walk with God must have a pure walk with God. This one touched me. And we say, well, okay, what's the big deal about purity? Purity means something that is unmixed. In Chad, Africa, where I worked, we would buy kerosene in these little drinking bottles. It was weird. You'd go to the market and you'd negotiate and you'd bring this kerosene home and you'd fill up your kerosene lanterns. We used those at times. And every once in a while you'd hear, boom! Or you'd hear the news of it. Somebody blew up. Because they would have a mixture of a little bit of gasoline with kerosene. Well, you know gasoline is an explosive fuel, so... Every once in a while, there'll be a little mixture there, and that's impurity, because purity talks about like kerosene with nothing else in it. When I would buy it, the Chadians would say, "C'est pure." It says pure, and you'd say, "You sure? Yes, uh, c'est pure." And you'd buy that and take it home. But if there was something else mixed in it, it was deadly. And that's the same with us as believers. Sin is deadly, and especially immorality. And I was compelled. I'm reading through the Book of Revelation in my own devotion time right now. And compelled by how many times Jesus speaks to the churches and says, Hey, I have this against you right here. You're, you're, following into the, you're going into the sin of immorality. Sexual immorality, it says. And I'm like, wow, Jesus, this is important to you, isn't it? Because our world wants us to completely walk away from Christianity and biblical teaching in this way. They want to undermine it and say morality is just like a gender thing or a race thing. You do whatever you want. You know, we're different. We're born this way. And Scripture says, oh, no, you are not. It's a moral choice. It's the bondage of sin. People say, I can't do this. I was born this way. This is the way I'm supposed to live. And this certain type of immorality, be it homosexuality, be it heterosexual immorality, be it whatever type it is. It is sin. Damning sin. And we love the sinner in the sense that we want the, the person themselves to come out of sin and be, be saved. But Jesus made it evident that this matters to him. Don't believe me? Read Ephesians 5, 1 through 18. Ephesians 5, 1 through 18. This one presents a strong argument for moral purity. And Paul goes beyond just saying, abstain from sexual immorality to, to saying, and pursue purity. Purity. The pure heart. Psalm 101, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. It's the pure that will see God. Matthew 5, 8. So we see that um, Enoch had this. By its very nature, to walk with God meant that he was pure because God doesn't hang with impure things. You say, how so? Read Psalm 101. God says, people I hang out with are the pure ones. Psalm 15. Those that are living in a way that pleases me, I will dwell with them. Others, no. You can't see God if you're living in impurity according to Jesus in the... Um, Beatitudes, the pure will see God. So Noah had this pure purity of life that enabled him to walk the walk. Lastly, those who walk with God have a peaceful walk with God. A peaceful walk. To walk with God is to walk with no fear. A peaceful walk, even as we face death. And Psalm 23 talks about this. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will what? Fear no evil. And these are dark, dangerous times. I remember I globetrotted across the Middle East, North Africa, and I went to Morocco and Israel and all that doing my ministry right after 9-11. I remember walking the streets of Morocco at night, you know, after all this had taken place as an American. 
was you know I was going to eat at a restaurant and I kind of was doing the easy thing then I'd, I'd eat at restaurants instead of trying to prepare my own meal when I was there in Morocco studying Arabic and I just remember hey I'm scared I'd tell myself this is scary you sure you should be doing this and probably I shouldn't in some neighborhoods I was going through but I just remembered thinking okay God you've called me here and I got to eat tonight and I ask that you protect me and help me to be wise too yes to, to walk around in the, more of the daytime but yet you know that that fear we can feel can't we so here we have David saying you know God is with me. I don't need to be afraid. And we can often be afraid in these times. We can be afraid to be that prophet, to speak out. And I believe it's going to switch more and more from social persecution to physical here in America. You may be imprisoned one day. You may be beaten up for your faith. Already we're getting social persecution, but we don't have to fear that. Paul and Silas, when they preached the gospel, did you see any shrinking back from them? They were beaten up and bloody in the prison of Philippi. There they were, and they were singing and praising God to the point where God says, okay, that pleases me enough, I'm going to send an earthquake. The place shakes, the chains fall off, and once again, Paul, Silas, they look at the Philippian jail, don't kill yourself, we are still here. And he says, what must I do to be saved, and so forth. And the, the Philippian jailer are saved. So that is our reality, Paul and Silas, even in the midst of all that, no fear. Does that mean we, we're not afraid? It means that we turn our fears over to God. David said, when I'm afraid, then I will trust Him. And I just encourage us, as we walk with God, and we're faced with decisions, don't let fear be the driver. Only one fear. A fear of God that says, hey, I'm calling you to Libya. Let's just throw a dangerous place out. We're heading that direction, and it enters our heart many fears and doubts. We come to God and say, Lord, did you not lead me here? You said you'll walk with me through the valley of the shadow of death. Jim is going to South Carolina. What's ahead of you there, Jim? You don't fully know. We're going to different places, and we step out, and everything's a walk of faith. Every time we put our foot on our brake coming down the dump, we're having faith. We believe it will slow us down. And it's the same way we say, God, you control every mechanism of life, and, and I'm looking to you. If you're asking me to do this, I will do it. So Enoch had this same courageous faith in the midst of a d dangerous time. My pastor, Harry Wallace, worked in Watts, L.A. And he worked for the famous E.V. Hill. Anybody ever heard of E.V. Hill before? Okay. He's dynamic. You would be hooping and hollering and shouting if he was preaching because he gets the crowd into it, brothers and sisters. He gets them and the whole crowd is, is going and, and um, just loves the Lord, preaches the solid word of God. And Harry was there walking down the streets at night with E.V. Hill. And, and Harry was scared. He's like, you know, should I be here? I'm a white dude in the midst of all this black hood here. I'm, I'm kind of scared. And E.V. Hill says, Harry, you're with me. I minister to these people. They know me, Harry. You're safe when you're with me. <laughs> and so that's what you should hear God saying as you're walking through the hood and you feel a little bit out of place. The, wherever you're called to, God's walking with you. You're, you're fine. So let's close with this final conclusion here. Enoch, faith to walk into heaven. What about you? So when God looks down, and, and He does, it says, I was reading this also in the book of Revelation, that God tests the minds and hearts. He says, I test the minds and hearts of the churches. He's testing your mind hard. He could come before you today and give an explanation like he does to the churches in Revelation 2 and 3. He could say, hey, Rob, here's, here's what you're doing good and here's what you're not doing good. He does that to a lot of the churches. Well, as he looks into your heart, what, what does he see today? Selfishness, pride, love, faith, truth, egoism, fear, doubt. What are the, the qualities that kind of come to the surface there as he's looking into the kerosene of your heart and says, whoa, oh, there's some explosive impurity in there. What does he see that he wants to remove? Second Chronicles 16.9 says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. To show himself strong to those that fully trust Him, it says in another version. So, God's eyes are moving everywhere, looking. He's looking at you. Will His eyes pass you by this time? Or will they stop on you and say, here's one. Here's one I want to show myself strong through, like Enoch. 
He's walking with me. She's walking with me. I'm going to support them. Oh, they're an unlikely person. Maybe even in their own minds, very unlikely. But they trust me. They're walking with me. And I will strongly support them. Their heart is blameless. And understand by the word blameless here, it's not talking sinless perfection. It's talking that your heart is blamelessly declared right before God through Christ. It has to be that way. To, to be a born-again believer, it has, your heart has to be perfect. Washed perfectly clean. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God. So our heart has to be fully righteous before God. That's salvation. And the next point, is you say, well, okay, I know I'm saved, but I still I struggle. Is my heart blameless? Here's the point. A heart that is given to practice righteousness, that responds to the Lord, that's not in open rebellion. If you're in open rebellion against something, let's choose our sin of the day, so to speak, pornography. Let's just take that one as an illustrative sin. If you're holding on to that, not releasing it, hiding it, continuing in that practice, you can say, my heart's not blameless in the way I'm living. And a blameless heart is battling. Maybe you've had a battle with that in the past and you say, hey, that's a temptation, but I'm battling it. By the strength of the Lord, Romans 6, I'm dead to sin and I'm walking in a pattern of obedience. And then you can say, you know, that's the kind of heart that God will honor. Blameless heart. So I hope you understand. Blamelessness is being declared righteous by Christ and blamelessness is one who's responding to the Holy Spirit, convicting of sin, and purifying because one day we'll be completely free of this flesh and not battle with sin anymore. But that is the day that we stand before God in heaven with our glorified bodies. As long as you're in the flesh, the battle will rage against sin. You've got to fight that one. You've got to persevere in that, that battle. And we're in this together. So let's pray for each other right now.